In 2020, you could buy a kilo of apples for $4.50. But in 2023, that price rose to $5.60. This inflation trend can also be seen for meat, bread, veggies, basically anything you can eat. And these steady price increases have been putting pressure on all of us. I'm, I'm thinking about pinching every dollar so that I can spend more on groceries. I'm thinking about downsizing my life so I have money left over for groceries. I've had to be more cooperative with my community. I've had to use the food bank more often. I've had to look into growing my own food. Me and a lot of people I know have been eating less than three meals a day. And a lot of people I know have been facing health problems that are related to malnutrition. So how did we get here? Let's unravel food inflation. The way we talk about it, actually the way the central banks talk about it, is year over year price changes. And it's not just one item like mortgages or rents or food, it is the entire package of prices. So it's weighted across everything we buy in an average purchasing basket. Before we get into the nitty gritty of pricing and costs, Let's take a look at how we get what we eat. The whole process begins with the grower or the producer, the farmer. They sell their items to the food processor or wholesaler. Then it goes to the food distributor or warehouse. And finally, it gets sent to the physical retail store. Every step of the process of getting food grown, harvested, processed, and packaged so that you can buy it has got middlemen and has got brokers. And each of these players is setting a price for their item to cover the cost and a little extra so they can make a profit. This also covers transportation costs at every step along the way and labor costs. So every time there's a step in the supply chain, there's a person involved and therefore an extra cost involved. Now this system has worked more or less for decades, but then the pandemic hit. First of all, the pandemic shut down the economy. So there were issues with getting food, since we import so much of our food, getting food across the border, having people transport it, having food that we import locked up at ports, having processing bunged up because people couldn't work in factories. The second disaster was Russia invading Ukraine. That area, the Russia and Ukraine area, is responsible for a third of global exports of wheat, 20% of global exports of corn, 80% of exports of sunflower oil, which is a major cooking oil in the world, and about 25% of global exports of fertilizer. The third disaster was climate chaos. We have seen droughts, fires, floods like never before since the pandemic began. And that is affecting things like olive production, olive oil production, coffee production, cocoa production, basically fruits and vegetables. And all of this plays a role in setting the cost of your groceries, but not just your groceries. Between the increased labor shortages, the grain market and energy market facing sharp and sustained changes, the cost of everything you buy and use is affected. And as Armin told us before, that increase in the cost of everything is called inflation. The rate of inflation that central banks aim for is about 2% per year, which is the Goldilocks spot. Not too much increase, not too little increase. Because inflation is a sign of a functioning economy. You want inflation to go up. You don't want it to be completely flat because you want some room for growth. And keeping it at a consistent rate makes things predictable for everyone. But in April 2021, we started to see the inflation rate rise and rise reaching a sharp peak of 8.1% by June of 2022. That's a stark increase in a little over a year. As of October 2023, the cost of food purchased in Ontario was up almost 6% from the year before. That includes fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, meat, and bread. This puts a lot of stress on all of us, but we haven't even talked about grocery stores. And how grocery stores set prices is a whole other kettle of fish. When it comes to price hikes, where do they come in? There are five big grocery retailers in Canada. Loblaw, Empire, Metro, Costco, and Walmart. They make up a whopping 77% of the grocery market in the country. And each of them posted record profits throughout 2021 and 2022. Their CEOs say they aren't profiting off of grocery store prices. In fact, they say their company's profits include increased sales on items 
other than groceries. Their profit margin on groceries remains flat. Our profit levels are reasonable, um, and we are working hard to lower prices for Canadians in every way that we can. We have one of the lowest um, um, earnings uh, profit margin in, in the world. We don't know how very powerful market players in highly concentrated markets set prices. So in highly concentrated industries where you've got so much of the market controlled by a handful of players, you've got the potential for more price collusion. So we need to make a distinction here between profit and profit margins. Profit is financial gain, the difference between what you buy something for and the price you sell it for. Profit margin is a ratio that measures the percentage of profit earned in relation to revenue. Basically, what percent of your revenue is pure financial gain? But that's a lot of words. Here's what that means. Even if the profit margin stays the same, an increase in the cost of goods means an increase in profit. Let's say you're a grocer. You have a basket of items that total $100. You then have to factor in your costs, labor, transportation, rent, etc. Fixed costs that you'll always have to pay, but you also need to make a profit. So you set your profit margin at 5%, and your customer pays $105 for that basket of goods. You've made $5 on that basket of goods. Let's pretend six months from now, that same set of items costs you $110, but maybe your fixed costs haven't changed that much. You keep your profit margin the same at 5%. But now your customer is paying $115.50, and you're making an additional 50 cents of profit on every sale to every customer. Now, this may not seem like a lot, but it can add up over millions of transactions. I mean, 1 million times 50 cents is $500,000. You used to be able to buy a house with that. Remember those record profits? Well, some are attributing that to the situation we just described. But when profits move higher than the rate of inflation, that can be called profiteering. And that's where companies make an excessive or unfair profit. Economists at the European Central Bank are even reporting that company profits and not labor costs or taxes are what's driving inflation. I think both are likely to be part of the answer on why we are paying more. About 10 years ago, there was in Ontario something called the Grocery Wars. For a brief period of time, there was a huge amount of competition, with every retailer trying to lure in customers to spend their money at their stores. But after the 2009 global financial crisis, people had less money to spend, and retailers realized the only way to grow market share, and therefore their business, was to buy out their competition. And of course, scale gives you the biggest deals, right? The more scale you have, the more you can drive bargains with your suppliers, you get price volume deals. Everybody knows that, why pay retail, right? It's cheaper by the dozen. In fact, in some ways, the markups we are seeing in grocery stores is coming from squeezing the suppliers who turn around and squeeze the producers. So can we get prices to come back down? The solution is always more competition, but how do you get it in a world that has been dealing with free money for about 15 years, where the rich get richer because they can keep borrowing at amazingly bargain basement rates, over leverage and buy everything in sight. In a world that's got free money and very slow growth, the only way to appease your investor and show that you have growth is to buy your competitor. About 125 years ago, Canada introduced the first antitrust legislation in the world, which said companies can't get too big. But this is a conversation we have every once in a while when capital becomes too concentrated in the hands of too few people. And that is the moment we are again in. It is upsetting everything we know about how capitalism should work. But legislation takes time. You have to draft a bill, present it to the House, study it in committee, hear from stakeholders. Part of getting the cost of food under control at this moment, given the degree of concentration in this industry and right through to the origins of where our food comes from, is simply more scrutiny. It requires you and me and our elected representatives to pay more attention to what's going on. There can't be the shield of corporate confidentiality over everything. We actually have to get more information about how prices are set and try and ferret out where there is collusion because collusion will be happening. Will prices ever come back down? The short answer, no. The longer answer is inflation is rarely followed by deflation. We may see the price of certain items drop, 
but we won't see across the board deflation, and we don't necessarily want to. That's a sign that the economy is in real trouble. Think decreased outputs and massive layoffs. And central banks were created to prevent this kind of volatility. What we're seeing now and what we expect to see is a lessening of inflation, disinflation, where the rate of inflation is moving downwards and potentially back to that goal of 2% annually. But it could still take a while to settle down completely.